Hello and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast, your source for the latest school-based occupational therapy tips, interviews, and research. Now, to get the conversation started, here are your hosts, Jason and Abby. Class is officially in session. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jason Davies, and this is episode number 22 of the OT Schoolhouse podcast. Today, I am, well, genuinely excited about this one because we're talking all about telehealth. And this is actually going to be one of our first professional development podcasts in a while. So you will have the chance to earn professional development by listening to this podcast and heading over to otschoolhouse.com forward slash episode 22 or otschoolhouse.com forward slash PD and purchasing the opportunity to take a short quiz and earn a certificate of completion for listening to this podcast. It's actually going to be an hour and 15 minutes worth of professional development, which is really cool. And all you have to do is sit back, listen, and then go take a short quiz of about 10 questions, and you'll be on your way with an extra 75 minutes of professional development that you can use for MBCOT recertification. With that said, let's jump into the objectives for today. Today, you will be able to, or at least by the end of listening to this episode, you'll understand the guidelines placed on service providers looking to provide telehealth OT services. You'll know what tools, both software and hardware, that are needed to provide virtual services. And you'll also understand the difficulties and limitations associated with providing virtual OT services. And with us today is Tracy Davis of TalkPath Live. She's an occupational therapist herself, and she's really been at the forefront of telehealth. In fact, I think she's been doing this. We'll get into it in a minute, but she's been doing this since 2012. I'm not even sure I was using Skype in 2012. So she's really come a long way and she's helped telehealth come a long way as far as occupational therapy services. Tracy is based in Ohio, but because she does telehealth, she provides services all over the country. That's pretty awesome. She could be providing services in New Mexico a half hour ago, and now she's providing services in New York City, perhaps. So it's a real treat to have her on and share her wisdom about telehealth. Like I said, Tracy is well-versed in telehealth, and she regularly provides trainings in telehealth, not only for employees of TalkPath Live, but also for other occupational therapists who are thinking about getting into telerehabilitation. So now, if you've ever thought about working from a computer in the area of telehealth, this is the podcast, this is the place for you to be right now. Obviously, you know how to get to access podcasts, so you must be somewhat technologically savvy. And, well, we're going to step up the game a little bit and figure out how we can do, well, therapy over a computer is basically what it is. So sit back, relax, and here is Tracy Davis. Hey, Tracy. Welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. How are you doing this evening? Just fine. Thanks, Jason. Great. And remind me again where you're actually located. I am in Ohio. That's awesome because we're doing telehealth and we're going to jump into, I know you don't just quote unquote work in Ohio. No, not at all. You're all all over the the place, right? Yeah. And so um, I'm super excited specifically for this podcast only because I've kind of looked into telehealth a little bit. Um, It is in a sense my dream to work from home, whether it be seeing kids in my backyard or doing telehealth or yeah. or even doing this podcast and blog full time, something like that. It's kind of my dream, uh, mostly because I want to be able to be there for my kids when I have them. But um, yep. I am excited about telehealth and I can't wait to get into this. So um, before we jump into that, why don't you give us a little bit of information about you, where you went to school maybe or, and how you got to where you are now? Sure, sure. So um, I uh, went to school in Wisconsin, a small school just north of Milwaukee. Um, I got both my bachelor's in psychology and master of OT there. Um, I have been in OT for a long time now. <laughs> I don't, I'm not even sure <laughs> it's that long now, maybe 19 years, something like that. Okay. Um, and I've been working with uh, children pretty much that whole time, so pretty much very versed in pediatrics. Um, I've been working in telehealth for um, a while now as well, about six years maybe or so, um, and I was one of two OTs when I first started working in telehealth at the company that I worked for, oh, okay. and so we kind of muddled through everything um, you know, together. I've worked with kids of all ages and all different settings, but um, my family moves around a lot. And so telehealth was the answer for me to continue my career, um, even though we move around a lot. And it, I 
have just really enjoyed it. So now mm -hmm. I, um, I'm now the uh, clinical director for a telehealth company, TalkPath Live, and um, I teach um, continuing ed courses as well and talk with people like you about the versatility and all the things that can be done in this, uh, with this service delivery model. That's awesome. I mean, you kind of jumped on really quickly into the telehealth world. If you've been doing it for six years, mm -hmm. what, we're 2018, 2012. I mean, yeah. as far as you know, when was like the first real telehealth, like, hey, someone's doing telehealth? Yeah. So it started with speech therapy. They were doing it before us, um, but not too much longer before us. Um, there were... There were a few people who were really doing some research in the you know early 2000s, but really it wasn't it wasn't until about um, well AOTA identified it as an emerging niche in 2011. Okay, so, oh, so you were right um, there was, then. I was pretty close, and their um, their first position paper came out in 2013. Okay, so um, so you know people were doing it before then uh, for research and things like that, but it really has only been in the last five six years that it's gotten to be um, sort of mainstream for occupational therapy. Okay, and I might edit this part out, but have you been in contact with AOTA as all when it comes to telehealth? Are you one of their go to uh, resources in a way? <laughs> I don't speak with AOTA as a um, as an organization, but um, I have I have spoken with some of the some of the people who wrote those documents. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Jana Kaysen is is a big one. She and um, Ellen Cohen they co-edit the international International Journal of Telerehabilitation. Oh. and uh, Ellen Cohen is a speech therapist, and Jana is an OT. And so, um, you know, they were kind of very much pioneers and, um, I, I, I run in those circles a little bit. So. There you go. Good. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you've been doing it around, I mean, like you said, it's emerging. You were, yeah. I mean, you had to be one of the first few hundred people maybe doing it and if not even sooner than yeah. that. So, um, probably. Because I didn't have a whole lot of people to ask. Questions. Exactly, right? <laughs> well, now it's a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, all right. Sure. Well, I want to hear from you exactly. How do you define telehealth when someone asks you, you know, like, what do you do for a living? How do you define it? Um, so I tell, I mean, if I'm talking to a lay person, I tell them that I provide therapy services to children um, uh, over a secure internet connection that I meet with them via video chat basically and that we do therapy together. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of exactly what it is because it's it's considered a service delivery model. So it's one of the tools in our tool chest essentially. It's not a specialty or anything like that. It's um, just one of the ways that we can provide services to ki to, to individuals, anyone. Anyone, Doesn't right? Have yeah. Yep. Very cool. And so – what do you say if an occupational therapist asks you, obviously they know what OT is and you're telling them it's telehealth now. Is it a little bit yeah. more, what, what questions do you get and what, what answers are you giving? You know, it's interesting. Um, I have to say that the biggest skeptics <laughs> are other therapists mm -hmm. and you know, it's just, um, OT is a hands-on profession and it's hard to picture how you can provide those services when you're not in the same room as the person that you're working with. And so I, I, I go into a little bit more detail, of course, but mm -hmm. if I were talking to a therapist, I would just tell them that I do exactly the same things that you might do. Um, but I use, instead of my hands, I use my voice to effectively communicate. And, um, we often, Compare it to a coaching model, which we've found to be highly effective, especially in, in areas such as early intervention and home health services. We're working with the, an entire team of people, caregivers included. And so we utilize coaching techniques in order to communicate what we need, what we need to happen. Yeah, and if anyone wasn't sure what this specific podcast episode was about, that just kind of summarized it all up, and I can't wait to dive more into it. So um, we talked a little bit about AOTA, kind of the, mm -hmm. the people that kind of do some, some telehealth in that community. Does AOTA specifically define telehealth? Do they have an official definition they for do. it? They do. They do. Within, their, within the position paper that they created, um, they – they defined it as the application of evaluative, consultative, preventative, and therapeutic services 
delivered through telecommunication and information technologies. Okay, and that's in the AOTA position paper you said on telehealth? Yep. Perfect. Correct. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. Um, but So that's AOTA's definition. What about other definitions? I know that doctors are doing telehealth. Obviously, you said speech therapists are doing telehealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it all pretty similar? And who else even is out there doing telehealth? Yeah, so um, telehealth is really... Uh, gotten so much bigger than it than it was it's still growing mm -hmm. um but but physicians are doing it a lot of specialty um physicians especially are doing it so um let's say that you live in a community that doesn't have a particular specialist um th then you might access a specialist through a, via telemedicine mm -hmm. And um, physical therapy, we um, physical therapists are doing it as well. And so they actually, um, APTA created a position paper in 2012, so around the same time as AOTA. Um, then we there's also a group called the American Telemedicine Association, and they have a lot of different resources, uh, things like that, but they have a telerehab special interest group. And so they've created a, it's an interdisciplinary document um, for all rehab professions where they um, also kind of, their original document was called the Blueprint for Telerehabilitation Guidelines. Um, it's been updated since that time um, and it might even have a different title now, but it's, it's just an update of the original position paper. Um, but all of them have very similar definitions and all of them identify telehealth as a viable service delivery model, um, meaning that, number one, you don't really need any sort of um, specialty certification to conduct telehealth services. Okay. And number two, um, research, you know, has shown it to be an effective means of delivering um, services. Perfect. I mean, that's kind of the two things that really uh, you need to know. Obviously, there's a few more, and we'll get into those here in a in a few minutes. So, so let's dive a little bit deeper into telehealth. Um, what are some examples of telehealth that's being used more specifically to OT? And maybe, you know, this is a school-based uh, platform that we're talking on here. What are some different ways that telehealth occurs in school-based therapy? Yeah. Um, so it actually is a little easier to picture telehealth when you go, when you use examples. So mm -hmm. um, specifically in school, in schools, um, all all school um, sites do make use of telehealth. So brick, some brick and mortar schools use telehealth therapists. Um, virtual schools use telehealth therapists. Um, the charter school system, like in California, so basically homeschooling families who are accessing special education make use of telehealth. So, that, so all, all different types of schools, um, there are schools that are using telehealth. Mm -hmm. And an example could be you could be doing a direct one-on-one -on -one session um, with a child using, you know, um, a pullout sort of scenario where they come and they sign into your virtual room and they meet with you. Um, we also um, conduct small groups um, using telehealth where there might be two kids sitting at one computer or there might be two kids from two different schools buildings within the same district mm. that are both signing in together for a group session. Okay. Um, so, and they basically just sign in to a, a video, you know, a, a compliant video um, software. Um, we use it for um, maybe for um, consultative sessions with teachers um, we, we use um, telehealth in order for our therapists to attend IEP meetings. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's there are all different all different areas where it's being utilized within the schools. I remember one person telling me that there's a difference between um, I think it's called synchronous and asynchronous um, mm -hmm. telehealth. What's what is that or what are those and, and what's the difference? Yeah, so synchronous um, technology is um, basically just real time. So that just means that you're providing a live therapy session or a live any type of session. So you and whoever you are working with are meeting in the, in the, at the same time in the same place. Asynchronous is store and forward technology. So um, we don't use it so much in the schools, um, although there are some scenarios where we use it. But, but basically you would make use of some sort of software where the therapist is putting um, maybe a home exercise program within into this software. The client then signs into that software, 
completes the home exercise program, including maybe even recording, you know, video recording themselves doing it. And then the therapist then signs back in, sees that they've done it, maybe watches the recording, makes adjustments. That would be asynchronous. Okay. So kind of think of it like an email. You know, you send the email now, but maybe the person opens the email later and takes action on it later. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Perfect. In fact, uh, I mean, does anyone use email as a way to perform telehealth? Uh, You know, you can, you can do that, but some states have laws that, you know, say that phone calls are not telehealth. Email is not telehealth. In fact, some states go so far as to say that you must be using the synchronous in order for it to be considered Mm. telehealth. Although there are lots of states that consider asynchronous, um, but, but they do, but a lot of places do require you to use some sort of software or something where um, you're each logging into the same website, maybe not at the same time, but you're logging into the same place, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, And you kind of touched on that, you know, different states have different things going on. So um, at what level is telehealth really regulated in the sense is it AOTA regulating it? Is it um, California Board of OT regulating it? Or who regulates it? And how are Mm -hmm. they different from maybe state to state? Yeah, so it's not federally regulated by AOTA or NBCOT or anyone like that. Um, Rather, AOTA provides guidelines um, for its use, its ethical use, and, you know, its effective use and things like that. Um, But state boards are who tend to regulate it. Um, there is some, there are some, uh, possibilities for, um, there to be a little bit broader regulation, um, because the problem with each state regulating is that each state's laws are different. Of course. So, um, one of the great things about telehealth is that you can, you know, you can work anywhere, Yeah. but, um, because different state laws are different, it's sometimes difficult if you, um, to cro- to be crossing state lines. Yeah. So um, there are you know there are some possibilities in the future for that to become a little bit more um, level across the board. But but the first place, if you had any questions at all about the regulatory laws within your state, would be to contact the state licensure board. That makes they're the sense. Ones who, there's a, they're the ones who, if there are any specific regulations for telehealth, they will know and they will be able to tell you. Gotcha. So the Board of Occupational Therapy in that state, right? Yep, exactly. I think everyone should know how to, they should know that website for your state and you should uh, maybe have them on speed dial every now and then. Um, (laughs) But you mentioned some platforms. Um, What do you mean by a platform? So um, by a platform, I mean just basically whatever it is that you're using um, to, to, um, as a virtual meeting space. So um, if it's an asynchronous platform, then it'd be, you know, one of those software programs I mentioned or something. Um, Or if it's synchronous, then then some sort of um, video video based um, meeting space. Mm -hmm. Um, But it needs to be HIPAA or FERPA compliant. So there, you know. Not just anything. <laughs> yes. And HIPAA and FERPA compliant, that's a whole nother, we won't dive too much into that. But <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because <laughs> for, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, yes. And for anyone, just really quickly, for anyone who doesn't know, FERPA is kind of like the school-based version of HIPAA. And it, it regards, it, it talks about educational documents that need to be secure as well as any sort of telehealth documents or telehealth videos that would need to be secure, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, so for instance, right now we're recording this on Skype. That would be considered a platform, but not necessarily a platform that would be okay for telehealth. Is that right? That is correct. So, um, the short answer here is that whatever you're using, you need to, um, you need to be able to get what's called a BAA certificate from them, meaning a business associate agreement. Uh And if if what you're using can supply you with that, basically that is the, 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 the software that you're using, the platform that you're using basically says we're encrypted and we follow, we follow these rules. Um, so that's what your BAA certificate does for you. 
And if you aren't using, if you don't have one of those, then it's not, you, it's not HIPAA or FERPA compliant. Now, I will say we're on Skype right now. Yes. And there are free versions of Skype and there are paid versions of Skype. Um, just like there are free versions of zoom and paid versions of zoom. Yeah. Yes. It's a lot of times the same thing. It's the same connection. Yes. (laughs) But you need, you know, uh, using the free version doesn't necessarily mean that you're being HIPAA or FERPA compliant. Does that make sense? Yeah. And from my experience too, and I think in my previous district, we were looking into even using Google Docs within a school district. And mm-hmm. we had the same type of conversation about mm-hmm. um, the BAA because yeah. Google Docs is not technically HIPAA, FERPA compliant. However, right. you can get that BAA, but in order to get the BAA, you have to basically upgrade to Google Suite and you have yes. to do all this application process. The school district has to... Uh, talk to Google. They have to set up their entire IT department, has to reorganize yeah. everything to make it set up. And yes. so um, I know just from that small experience how difficult it can be for a school district to get set up with a BAA with a company. Yep. Uh, yep. It might be a little simpler if it's just you and, you know, I'm sure Google has an entire team that you can contact and it's probably not too difficult but when you're looking at you know a school district that has thousands of computers and an it Mm -hmm. department and all that good stuff um can be a little crazy i'm sure it can get that way um but what some places do and the company that i work for does is we use we use a ferpa compliant um platform for our video sessions but then we have proprietary software for all of our documentation and everything like that so it doesn't have to be an all-in-one solution Mm -hmm. and um if there are some reasonable um video video platforms that you can that are not very expensive and that you can that you can get that are hipaa ferpa compliant so um well i i typically use zoom Um, that's just what I use because I have found it to be, um, pretty user friendly for, Mm -hmm. um, new clients who are signing in and things like that. It's just pretty easy to use. And, um, I have, I have a paid version of zoom and it is, um, it's pretty reasonable and wasn't very hard. So, um, so there are options out there, but yeah, that's just kind of a whole, I feel like that's a whole nother discussion, oh, yeah, you know, with all of that, <laughs> it's just important for the listener to know that, you know, just signing on to FaceTime or something with someone doesn't uh-huh. necessarily mean that you're following the guidelines that you should be following. Exactly. I mean, and it's hard cause technology, I mean, it's so accessible now. I mean, it, I, I want to say even like three years ago, it was harder to do what we're doing right now, talking with yes. video over Skype. I Correct. mean, it, it's amazing how fast technology is going. And um, I mean, we've already talked about laws and re- regulation a little bit, but, you know, it, it's trying to keep up with with um, with telehealth. I mean, so and all the technology. Yeah. Um, and it's in the hands of a lot more people now, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know when I start a session with someone, I mean, everybody, like, it's not that difficult for people to, you know, to click a link to sign into my therapy room anymore. Um, because everyone has access. Most people have access to something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the platforms these days have, um, like app versions on smartphones or tablets. And, you know, we don't really recommend telehealth on smartphones just because the screen's so So small. small. But, you know, the access doesn't necessarily have to be from a computer. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's it's amazing what we can do. It just it just really is. <laughs> it is. So I think that's a, a good segue now. Like, what do you see? You've been doing it for a while. What do you see as the benefits of telehealth that maybe even more so than regular occupational therapy in a school? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Our out like. Research wise, our outcomes measures are showing outcomes equal to and in some cases greater than um, in person services, which is very interesting to me. Um, I have my own theories about that. But um, I think one of the biggest benefits is I work with 
a lot of very remote school districts that literally cannot find a therapist. Yeah. And these kids who hadn't had therapy all school year long now are making progress on their IEP goals, um, you know, on their OT goals, on their IEP, because because we're able to meet with them, um, mm -hmm. you know, over an Internet connection. And it's not only remote areas, but we have found even in some very urban areas where um, maybe it's hard to retain a therapist. Maybe it's an area of town that um, isn't quite as safe or maybe, you know, there's just there are just other barriers to getting into those environments yeah. um, that make it very difficult. We you know, I, I can give you an example, too, of um we are working with a school district that has a lot of children who have ASL needs and they don't have any therapists on staff who know ASL. Um, but we are able to provide them with an ASL um, fluent therapist. Oh, okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, you yeah. know, she doesn't, she doesn't live anywhere close to them, yeah. but we're able to hook them up via telehealth. Yeah. So, um, so those kids are accessing service too. So it's not just geographic barriers that we're talking about, but it could be language barriers or cultural barriers um, um, that, you know, or even, even just travel restrictions. You know, we, we do some work with kids. We do work with kids who um, are in like a home hospital based school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they don't have to miss out on any therapy there either. There you go. So I think that's probably the biggest benefit that I see. Um, is just getting kids access. access to therapy. Yeah. What about for the the team, the other players on the IEP team? You know, maybe the speech therapist, the teacher, the administrator. Do you see a benefit for them as far as you being part of the team? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes um, it's a little bit of a learning curve for people, you know, trying to get used to the idea of, of a therapist not actually being in the building. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, um, we have had some very great relationships with the team. Um, you know, I don't know what kind of district you work in, but when I worked in this in a brick and mortar school, I did a lot of traveling. And yeah. I had to supervise some CODAs. And we hardly ever crossed paths because we were all traveling everywhere all week long. Mm -hmm. And um, this way, you know, we we are able to connect um, via email and phone and even sometimes, you know, in in our virtual meeting spaces. And it doesn't we don't have to worry about the travel pieces and things like that. So that's been really beneficial to to team members. Um for, cool. you know, that we don't have to all get into the same place at the same time. Yeah. And you mentioned two big things there. I'll ask you one at a time. CODAs. Yeah. Are there CODAs working as telehealth? There are some CODAs working as telehealth. You have to check with your specific state because some states allow it and some states don't. So when you say allow it, do you mean the billing of it or just even the practice of it? The, the practice of it only because of the supervision piece. Um, so, but honestly, I have found supervision to be almost easier mm -hmm. because if, if we're providing telehealth services, I can just literally sign into yeah. the session yeah. as supervisor. So, and just, I usually just don't turn on my video or my audio Yeah, and I and just, just watch. Mm -hmm. And if I need to, I will, but, um, you, know, you have no so. idea. I would have loved that when I was supervising a coding, you know, just to be able to kind yeah. of pop in and be a fly on the wall and just check yes. in. And then yeah. you don't even have to do anything at that moment. Like you said, you can leave everything off, but then yeah. after that session is over, after school's out and you have time, you can, you know, give your yep. coda a quick call or yep. the coda can exactly. call you and say, Hey, I had difficulty um, with this student and boom, they, you, yeah. I mean, that way sounds even better. I could imagine my coder saying, hey, I'm having difficulty with so-and-so. Can you attach into my phone call this time at this day yeah. when I'm working with them? Exactly right. Versus um, me I having to travel across the district. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it really, it really truly is easier. And I think, um, in fact, I know that speech therapy tends to be using it a little bit more mm -hmm. um, in that way. Um, I think we have some catching up to do there, but I just see that as just another great, great benefit of telehealth. Yeah, is being able to use codas and provide that kind of, that level, the level of supervision that we need. Wow. Yeah. 
All right. The other thing that I wanted to ask, again, kind of looking at the benefits, is the benefit for the clinician. And one thing that I wrote down real quick is you mentioned collaboration. What about collaboration with other OTs? Do you get that as a telehealth provider? Um, You need to be very intentional about it (laughs) because we're all working from home. And so it's easy to kind of get isolated. But Mm -hmm. there are a lot of really... um, easy things you can do to connect with other people. There's some great Facebook groups that are specifically for telehealth therapists. Um, so I would encourage you to, to just, you know, even just do a search, um, because everybody has, has Facebook, but <laughs> it's funny. Cause um, I think that's actually how I found you, right? It was, I think, I think it was it through was. the telehealth I group. Yeah. So, um, so there are some great groups there. There are some that are interdisciplinary and some that are, you know, just for OTs. Um, but, there are always people, I mean, I get, I get emails every single week from people who are saying, you know, I want to add telehealth, you know, what can you tell me? Can you, can we collaborate a little? Can you tell me what you know, basically? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but you do have to be a little intentional about it just because it's easy to get isolated. Yeah, I believe it. You got to make time, you know, for listening to podcasts like this one, (laughs) going to (laughs) conferences and stuff like that, you know, just like any other OT does. Exactly. Um, yep. All right. One more last, I guess, person or entity that I feel might have been a benefit from is the payer um, in school based. That's obviously mm-hmm. different than what it would be like in a hospital. But um, how does billing work when it comes to Medicaid and providing telehealth? Yeah. So there are some states that do reimburse as uh, Medicaid for telehealth services. Not every state does currently, but um each time I check, it's more states have been added um, as uh, um, as allowing telehealth for Medicaid. So, you know, basically within the schools, I mean, it just it's kind of the same thing. You just um, when I provide when I provide bill, uh, you know, I when I work privately and I provide like a super bill or something like that, then I usually put there is a location code of O2. Mm -hmm. um, is for telehealth. Um, so, you know, there's a specific location code that you put in there, um, when you're billing, but it works the same as everything else. If you're in a state that Medicaid reimburses for telehealth. Now, if you're not in a state that, that reimburses for telehealth, Medicaid, I mean, um, then telehealth is being used a lot less by schools. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are still um, a lot of schools that use it anyway, because ultimately it it is a cost savings. Um, We were talking about traveling between locations and with, without the traveling um, therapists are more productive, you know, when you don't have to, you can see more kids in a day yep. and things like that. So there are some cost savings. So there are schools that, you know, even schools that can't bill for Medicaid for telehealth services are still utilizing it just, um, you know, with their special ed funding. Gotcha. No, that's very cool. Um, yeah. What do you see now, the opposite side of all this, what do you see as some of the challenges? Um, some of the things that I'm thinking of is, uh, like you said, working in a completely different state, if you will. Um, You just kind of mentioned scheduling a little bit and traveling. That's Mm -hmm. kind of a benefit, but also I'm sure it's also a challenge. Yeah. Um, So, so what are some of the challenges? So personally, you have to be very organized. Um, You have to, you have to keep track of your schedule and so you don't have random kids popping into your virtual therapy space, you Uh know, on not right times and things like that. And you have to be a very good communicator, um, via email and phone. And even just during the therapy sessions, you have to be able to communicate what you want to see happen. Um, you have to be able to show it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so personally, those are kind of some of the challenges that I found when I started doing telehealth. And I found that to be um, a pretty steep learning curve at first. Uh, so that was, that was a little hard, nothing that you can't overcome, but you know, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, the Medicaid piece where not every state is, is reimbursing, um, is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, licensure is also a challenge because currently you need to be licensed in your state of residence and whatever state you practice in. So, um, PT is a little bit ahead of us on this. They've actually um, joined physicians and nurses to sign a telehealth compact. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, they, it it went active recently. 
um, I'm not exactly sure when, um, a couple months ago maybe, but basically um, several states have signed this compact. I think currently maybe eight of them are live, and but there are a whole lot more that are going to be live. Okay. And so what this compact means for PTs is that if you are a resident in one of the states that has signed the compact and you are licensed there, you may practice telehealth in any of the other states that have signed the compact. Oh, okay. um, so I, I hope the OT follows that trend because it will make the licensure piece um, easier because um, you can get cross license. You yeah. can get licensed yeah. in a state where you're not living, um, but it gets a little expensive um, for one complicated. Thing. Yes. It's expensive um, for all those licenses and it's complicated because each state might have different regulations as far as continuing ed go mm-hmm. and when your license expires. I mean, when I had, when I was holding, um, six state licenses, I just had to make a spreadsheet of the state and when it expired oh and any special continuing yeah. ed classes that needed to happen and things like that. And it just, it was, it was hard to keep track of. So, I can imagine. I mean, yeah. I know I get a lot of continuing, continuing education units in every year, but still even right. just remembering where I put the certificates or making Excel right. spreadsheets so that when it's time to turn them in just for one state yes. and NBCOT is enough. I mean, I can only imagine and, doing it for three, four, six states. And Oof. this state needs, um, once an ethics course and oh. this state wants an HIV course and this state wants, a you know, um, wow. I don't know, some sort yeah. of like safe handling course. So mm-hmm. you have to keep track of all of that. So that's, that's kind of a challenge as well. Gotcha. All right. Well, um, I think this is where we're going to kind of transition a little bit um, into what does a day look like for you when you, you know, you get in front of your computer, what does that kind of look like for you at a school-based model? Um, So, you know, in a school-based model, you, you have. Hold on one second, Tracy, Tracy, give me one second. Let's say you. You there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Let's start that over. You, uh, yeah. internet went bad. Um, so, so. Oh, let, oh, okay. No, I'll I'll just ask you the question again, so that way it's a natural transition. So, yep. um, so transitioning a little bit now to uh, kind of what the day to day looks like. You know, I think a lot of therapists are a little scared about what it would look like for them. Um, what does that look like for you in your workday when you're working in a school based model through telehealth? Yeah. So if I were working in the schools um, and I had several students to see, I will have already prepared a little bit beforehand because let's say I need to work on cutting with some of my kids and I want to do a cutting worksheet. I will have probably emailed that to Mm -hmm. whoever is bringing the the student to therapy, which I, I need to make this point is that in the schools, when we're working with kids in the schools, we, there is, there's always an adult who is, bringing the child to therapy and usually it's up to you as therapists to decide what role they will play. You know, are they just available if needed? You know, is this a middle schooler you're Mm -hmm. working with and they're fairly self-sufficient or is this a kindergartner and you need that adult to provide assistance throughout the entire session? Um, so, but regardless, there will be someone. So I will have probably, you know, sent a little bit of preparation to the, to that person, that person. Um, you know, and if, if it's some sort of worksheet or something, they will have printed it out or something like that. Um, so you have to kind of plan ahead of time a little bit. For yeah. That. And, and I'll speak to that just a second. Um, in yeah. a district that I used to work at, they did go ahead. We couldn't find enough speech therapists in our area. And so they did do speech for telehealth and even just setting up that trying to manipulate the aids within the district, because obviously they didn't want to hire one aid at every school just for telehealth. And so they really had to be, I mean, they had to be efficient with the way that they worked with the aid so that someone was always in that room and also just to find a computer even at some, at some of the schools. (laughs) And that has been a challenge at some schools. And we try and be very creative with, you know, the fact that we need an adult present, you know, because we don't, Obviously, we don't need the school doesn't want to be having to hire a person just Mm -hmm. to bring the kids to therapy plus pay the therapist. Right. So we try and be um, very creative there. Um, But it a lot of times it's someone like maybe a paraprofessional Mm -hmm. 
um, or someone like that. And sometimes it's, you know, we've even set the computer up in the back of a classroom. Yeah. Um, you know, not necessarily in a separate space. Yeah. All right. So, sorry. Go ahead and continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, so then, um, I would, I would sit down and I usually, um, don't bother with creating, you know, all of these schedule and meeting invites and things like that. It gets very complicated. Uh-huh. Um, and I like to, I like to have one link for all the time. So, um, so I have it set, you know, some of the, some of the platforms have this quote unquote waiting room feature. So basically when someone tries to come into my virtual meeting space, they're put in this other space and then I'm alerted that they're there and I have to let them in yeah. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I sit down and I wait for my student to come and, um, what you need to know about telehealth is that it looks very, very similar to what you're already doing. Um, you know, it's not a bunch of just high tech games and this and that I'm in OT. So I still do a lot with Play-Doh. I still do yoga. I still, um, I still do dance to YouTube videos Mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, I might sit down and they might come in, but I'm not necessarily going to stay seated. You know, we're going to, we're going to get up and we're going to move around, which, which brings me to another point is that. Um, you really need an external webcam if you're going to provide telehealth services. Um, cause your built in laptop camera, if you want to point it at the table, then you're closing your laptop. So, um, so you need to, you need to not only have one, which they're very inexpensive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like 20 bucks, you know, nothing, nothing huge. Mm-hmm. Um, but you need to have that and you need to make use of it. So if you're doing something fine motor wise, then you want to point the camera, not at your face, but at your hands. If you want to, if you're doing something gross motor wise, then you need to point the camera at your body. You need to stand up and you need to move. And so, um, so you need to be very aware of what your camera is pointed at. What is it that the student is seeing? And so they're going to come in and I'm going to, we're going to do some warm up movements and then we're going to maybe do some tabletop you know origami or play-doh or something Mm -hmm. like that and maybe we'll do some handwriting or cutting or something but all the same activities and how much so when i think of it this is as occupational therapists we're allowed to use codas as a either aid in our own treatment or as an aid to do their own treatment but under our supervision Mm-hmm. But that person that's in there, if it is a paraprofessional, how much can they help you? So it'd be it'd be a little better if you thought of that person more in that early intervention or home health kind of scenario where it might be a caregiver, but not necessarily a skilled therapy assistant, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. So you're still going to make use of them. You're still going to um, instruct them. Um to, you know, help you with maybe making sure that the student is has nice posture or their chair is facing the table or something like that. But I wouldn't ever ask them to do something that, you know, would be considered skilled therapy. Gotcha. Um, but we use people like that all the time. We instruct caregivers um, in home exercises mm-hmm. and we get their feedback when they come back to therapy and so we can use we can use the the aide who comes with the student in much the same way. So they might awesome. help me get out materials. They might toss the ball back and forth um, with the with the student, um, or maybe even I mean, even you know I have I have um, given input to you know oh I, I'm noticing that their shoulder the one side of their shoulder is up just a little bit. Can you just put your no hand problem. just gently on their shoulder? You know, nothing, nothing that's outside of what their scope might be, mm-hmm. um, but just providing that little bit of cues. Great. Yeah. I think that makes sense um, because originally going to school and doing a level one or level two field work, I remember um, being in more of an acute rehab setting or something like that where they had therapy aids. And we were mm-hmm. kind of taught that the therapy aid is not to have any sort of contact, or at least in like California, this is what we were learned or we yeah. were taught, you know. Yeah. Um, but when we come to thinking of a special education classroom um, at a school district, it's so 
so often you see either an aide or a teacher providing that hand over hand assistant. You don't have to be mm -hmm. you don't have to be a, a OT to provide hand over hand right. instruction. So Correct. I think that that fits in from what yeah. I see. So okay. yeah, and if they're working at the school, then they're already authorized to be working with the children. So exactly. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So I think this is going to be a big question that everyone has that is listening. Evaluations. Yes. How do you do an evaluation? Are you limited in your assessment tools that you can use or how does that work? Yeah. Um, so uh, we do an evaluation in much the same way. I meet together with the students. Um, I do think that there are some things that are harder to see. Number one, it's I think it's very hard to really truly assess ocular motor movements mm -hmm. um, over the over the computer. Even with a great internet connection, if you're looking at some subtle jerkiness, you know, the smooth pursuits and things like that, it's yeah. kind of hard to see. Um, so, you know, I'll just lay that out there. And I'm the first to say, you know, sometimes there are things that we have to problem solve around. Um, but I will also say that when we're working in the schools, what are we doing? We're determining if the student is eligible for services. Yeah. And so, you know, you might not need that level of detail um, in order to determine their eligibility. So for an evaluation, um, a lot of times if I'm doing maybe standardized testing, it might involve a paper booklet, like, mm -hmm. you know, the Beery VMI yeah, or you know, TVMS or something. Yes, exactly. So um, we physically mail those booklets to the school. And then the, the adult who's helping, um, some people call them e-helpers, some people call them learning coaches, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, we instruct them in how to place that booklet in front of the student. Don't tilt it. You mm -hmm. know, please place it right in front of them. Give them a pencil. Don't please don't, you know, prompt them in any way, that kind of thing. Um, and then um, they either mail them back or they scan in the in the the booklets the and, and email and back. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there are several assessments and there are even some companies, some publishers of some assessments that have been working um, to make them more accessible for us by digitizing the manual, the examiner's manuals um, or, or the test plates, you know, if it's a visual perception test yeah. or something like that. Honestly, I'm surprised that there's not already like Pearson or something working on a lot of iPad based um, assessment tools. And I'm sure that I might know. be in the work by now, but it, I mean, it kind of is, um, it kind of is, but I'm surprised that it's going a little slower than, yeah. than it is now. Um, sensory, sensory, uh, testing, very easy to do because both the sensory processing measure and the sensory profile yeah. are online. Mm -hmm. So they can be done easily. Um, we can do visual motor, um, testing there's, uh, and visual perceptual testing, um, we can do those and we can do most things of the bot. Um, the, the hard part is anything that has specialized equipment is, uh, yeah. is a challenge. You know what I mean? So any testing material, like, you know, the blocks, the, the string of the, the whole, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. Peabody, you know, that kind of thing. So do um, you ever send those materials or do you kind of just try to use alternative methods to get the information that you need? Yeah, we usually just try and use alternative methods just because it gets really difficult. Now, if you're only working with one district or, you know, yeah. like you're working independently, then that wouldn't be so difficult. But um, I work with a company that provides services to so many mm -hmm. districts that that it's just we can't we can't send those materials to everyone. Gotcha. So. No, that makes sense. Um, all right. Well, I kind of oh, we we're talking about evaluation still. So. Uh, moving forward now, do you do a classroom observation sometimes or? Uh-huh. Yeah, So they do. just set you up in the back of the classroom somewhere or something uh -huh. with the computer and boom, you're in? Yeah, making sure that um, making sure that I as therapist can see the person I'm evaluating and, you know, some other peers to uh -huh. see how some of that interaction goes. Um, and then we're just, we talk in great detail with the teacher, um, either via email or phone or, or whatever. And, um if we need to take something like a handwriting sample, then typically I'll just have them, you know, scan it and send it back to me so that I can take a look at that. Um, 
And, you know, I, I'm going to also prompt them to be moving their camera down to the tabletop. If I'm looking, if I'm looking at fine motor movements or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so some States do, um, require something like informed consent, we call it. And so I just, as best practice, always include a statement in my evaluation that, you know, this was conducted via telehealth and that, you know, the school was informed and are in agreement um, with this service delivery model. Okay. And speaking to that real quick, is there any sort of extra paperwork, I guess you have to say? I mean, we have to get an assessment plan, you know, for any student who's going to be assessed. But is there any sort of form that has to go home to the parent saying that you're being, your child is going to be assessed and or treated via telehealth? Um, Or is that state to state? Yeah, it's state to state. But as best practice, we just try and we, we make sure that that parents are informed of that, um, before we start services. That makes sense. Um, so they, and if, if we're, you know, doing an evaluation, we send home a consent to evaluate and they sign it and, and give it back to us. Just, it's just, um, for our records, it's just kind of what we, what I think is good practice to do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. You've mentioned a lot of things that people already need or already, um, I'm going to start that over. All right. So you've mentioned a lot of things throughout this, you know, 45 minutes or so that we've been on about what someone might need, a platform, the hardware that they need. They need an external camera. Um, they mm-hmm. obviously need to have a computer that works. And um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're already having some technical difficulties tonight. So people need to make sure they have some some right. fast internet, you know. Um, yeah. But what else might they need if someone wanted to do telehealth? Uh, you know, that's kind of, those are kind of the big ones, um, the, and, um, what I consider to be necessary pieces of equipment, um, a couple just luxury items, um, that you don't necessarily think about. Um, it's really nice to have a second monitor because you can put the student on one screen and you can pull up their goals on the other screen. Um, and then you can keep them nice and big. (laughs) I wish I had that just like every day, like (laughs) for all my treatments. My second monitor wasn't working the other day and I just felt lost without it because (laughs) I'm so used to it now. It makes me so much more productive. And Uh I actually, I did telehealth for probably a year before I invested in a second monitor and it cost me, I think a hundred dollars and I don't know like as soon as I got it I had no idea why I just didn't do it from the beginning because for the for the um level the improvement in my efficiency and my productivity it was just so worth the investment um so and then you just need to have a secure way to be sending documents um you know at the bare minimum you need to be password protecting you know if you've written a report and you have to send it to the school um, speaking of so, that, okay. So a report, yeah. I, we, yeah. we kind of skipped that part of the evaluation. What does that look like when you are doing a report, you're presenting a report? I mean, it looks pretty much the same as any other, um, as any other piece. The, the one thing that I also include is when I, the standardized tests aren't necessarily standardized for telehealth use. And so I usually put a statement in there just saying that, saying that, but Mm -hmm. then I say, but with clinical observation, these skills are thought to be representative of current, of the level of function. Yeah. Um, just to make sure to cover all my bases, but, um, it's, it's pretty much just the same report that everybody else does. And I know with the company that we were using, the speech therapist would call in. Is that pretty typical, a call versus having to um, screen time or whatever you want to call it in video? Um, or do you do video? We usually do video. Okay. Um, but it just depends. If you know, if it's a brick and mortar school, it's just a little easier with video because typically everyone's sitting around a table. Yes. And then for you to be there too, like being seen is nice. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about a virtual school scenario, then probably everybody's calling in. Yeah, that's true. So it just depends on the setting. Gotcha. Yeah, because, I mean, and that's the same thing whether or not you're on telehealth or in just an everyday brick and mortar IEP. I mean, for instance, yesterday we actually had a face to face in the school IEP, and it was a part two to a meeting that had been over the phone. 
And oh. because the meeting that had been over the phone, because it was over the phone, everyone just so much communication was lost. And oh, yeah. that has nothing to do with telehealth. That was a high school yep. that I work at, brick and mortar. And just the communication just wasn't there over the phone. And, you know, yeah. as OTs, yeah. you know, we know, we understand as most people do, facial expressions matter, body language matters, all of that good yeah. stuff is, you know, 90% yeah. communication is not what is spoken, as they like to say. So um, yeah. it's important and to be present. I mean, I, I go to a lot of meetings because I'm a clinical director for this company and mm -hmm. I, um, I go to a lot of meetings that, you know, where schools are coming on board and things like that. And I really prefer this format. I mean, you and I are looking at each other yeah. right now and I really prefer this format as opposed to just a phone call because, um, I think, I think it just sets everything off on the right foot. And, um, one thing is that, um, you know, sometimes we get, I don't want to say resistance, but just questions about how it's all going to work yes. and things like that. And so maybe I'll go into a school and I'll do a meet and greet where mm -hmm. my I'll leave my therapy room open and parents can, you know, classroom 101 has my is, oh. is logged into my therapy room. And when they go to pick up their kids, they can stop and say hi and ask any questions. Huh. And it it tends to diffuse a lot of that anxiety that of, um, surrounding what telehealth is when you guys, you can actually see it in person and you can understand, you know, I had a teacher say once she, she actually said to me, I just don't know how I'm going to get my, my, um, students to interact with a computer. And my answer was, <laughs> you don't have to, I'm a person. Yep. <laughs> They're interacting with me. It just happens to be over the computer. Yeah. But the interaction is with me, a person, the same as if I were in the room. And you can tell she never even considered that. Yeah. So, you know, just actually having this format and being able to see what it looks like really tends to um, dispel a lot of that, those fears. Absolutely. And I know when we, again, we had the speech therapist coming in for our, it was about half of our district because we couldn't find enough speech therapists. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was, I mean, that five to 10, maybe 15% of parents that were skeptical about it and they didn't mm -hmm. want their child being seen by a computer, yeah. quote unquote, you know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they were resistant. And so I can imagine, you know, you do get that 10% or so that are like, whoa, what's going on? Um, but for the most part, I heard good things about it for speech and um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're doing great with OT and you love it. Um, yeah, what, I do. You know, I never got to, I didn't ask you this at the beginning. What, what drew you into telehealth? Well, you know, I had read some research on it. Um, I had read some inter interesting articles on it, but ultimately I decided to give it a try just because my family moved around so much and I was mm -hmm. tired of starting over every time we there you moved. Go. Um, but I stuck with it just because of number one, the flexibility. I just mm -hmm. love the flexibility. I make my own schedule. I, you know, I decide I, I took my daughter to the nutcracker today. And there so, you, you know, and, and then I came home and I worked. So, um, that is really nice. I love the collaboration aspect because, because I'm not physically present. I'm, I'm kind of relying on the adult who's yeah. with the student. And, um, so it's more than just me saying, Oh, we worked on this today in therapy. You know, the, the, that that adult helper is is kind of an active participant in a lot mm -hmm. of what I'm doing, which I think aids that collaboration, I think, is what's helping our outcomes measures, because I think people are getting a greater understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I think that is leading to better carryover throughout yeah. the week. Yeah. So I love that collaboration piece. And I like the problem solving as well. Um, we tend to... Um, we tend to attract a lot of therapists who are maybe secure in their therapy skills. They've been doing therapy for a while, but um, they want kind of a little bit of a different challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is it because it's a lot of problem solving. How can I accomplish this goal when I'm not in the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so. super cool. I, I <laughs> Again, I'm already thinking about how I would probably do this at some point. And I think a lot of OTs don't even realize, but I think a lot of OTs are going to be doing this in the future at some point. Um, cause, I think it's only going to grow. Yeah. I mean, really. I, I'm right there with you. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I kind of want to, I want to push you a little bit on that. Where, yeah. where, what's the next step in telehealth or where do you well, see telehealth going? I think, 
I think number one, we need to kind of rally and really push for clear guidelines, not guidelines from, you know, AOTA has really done some good guidelines. Um, the world Federation of occupational therapists has some great guidelines. Um, but as far as just like different state regulations, Mm -hmm. um, there's just so much out there that has actually hindered the progress. Um, at one point, Texas required, and they've since rescinded this, but it's only recently that this happened, that they rescinded it. But they, they were requiring an in-person evaluation followed by um, an in-person therapist signing off on the telehealth sessions. What? And the whole, it, it just defeats the purpose of telehealth yeah. because yeah. you can find an in-person therapist. Why would you, I mean, like, then just use the in-person therapist, exactly. you know, so. Um, so I think there there is some regulation going on in states that is kind of hindering our progress, and so I think we need to get we need to rally, and we also need to, as therapists, not hinder each other either. Yeah, we need to we need to be more supportive. Um, yes, and open to it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I just think about you know nowadays i have a well i shouldn't say a i have three google homes in my house um i don't have you know like the facebook portal one now or anything yet but we are all just getting so much more used to technology in our house in our daily lives listening to us watching us doing i mean mm-hmm. I, I did make fun of my speech therapist yesterday cuz she had a she had a piece of tape over her camera on her computer <laughs> i was like are you scared of people watching you and she's like yeah <laughs> But, um, (laughs) but for the most part, you know, people are becoming more familiar and more understanding of technology. Um, I really do think of the portal as the new thing and I could see eventually pieces of technology like that being used for telehealth, especially more of the, uh, medical Mm -hmm. model and, um, and nurses checking in on patients and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I, I think the portal, the Facebook portal now is the first one that can actually follow you when you move. So the camera actually yes. looks at you as you move across the room, which is, Correct. I mean, only amazing for telehealth reasons, you know? Um, right, right. And so yeah, I get the, the potential is, is huge. Exactly. So, um, I want to ask you two more questions before you go. Um, okay. can you share a time where telehealth just like was the perfect opportunity to be used in a school-based setting. Yes, I do have a great, fantastic story. I had I had a child with autism who transferred um, to a virtual school, and so from a brick and mortar school. So he came to me for virtual therapy, and his dad was his learning coach, so to speak. Um, he when he first came to me, he just his attention was all over the place, you know. So. I knew that we, and his IEP um, that came with him from the brick and mortar school said two 45 minute sessions a week. Um, And his attention was not great. And I thought, oh, so we just developed this plan. Um, We had this, I had this YouTube video that I used every single time to mark the start of therapy and another one to mark the end of therapy. I mean, I could sing those songs in my sleep. It was (laughs) crazy. Um, and then I used the whiteboard feature of the virtual space to make, um, just basically a a schedule of what we were doing. And I would let him mark it off each time. And, um, we were doing a lot of sensory breaks and things like that. And in Ohio, when they come in on transfer IEPs and we have 30 days to kind of assess how things are, and then we have an IEP to create a new IEP. So by the fifth session, so it, he has therapy twice a week. So that mm-hmm. be, by the beginning of his third week, he was going through his 45 minute sessions. No problem. His attention was appropriate. He was doing everything. He was loving it. You know, great. So when we got to the time to recommend, make our recommendations, I, he didn't even need two 45 minute sessions anymore, but he had two highly educated parents and you know how parents can get kind of attached yeah, of to therapy. So I thought, I don't know. So I called them to tell them I'm not, I'm going to recommend a decrease in services. And, um, immediately his parents said, absolutely fine. And so we actually ended up cutting it in half to one 45 minute session. And so I asked, I said, out of curiosity, you know, why were you so quick to agree? And they said, well, he loves therapy and we love therapy too, OT also, but because dad was his learning coach and Uh he was participating in therapy every day, they said, for the first time ever, 
we know what he does in OT. We know why he does it. We know what it's working on. And so he gets OT every day. We do the, we do the activities that, you know, the things that you yeah. want to do during therapy. We do it every single day. We, yeah. we follow through. So that was just a huge success story for what we could accomplish. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that collaboration piece. Yeah. So that was one of my, one of my brighter moments. It was, it was great. Yeah. And on the other end of that, I mean, even if the kid wasn't a homeschool kid, if you want to call it that, but if the kid was in brick or mortar and you were mm-hmm. providing this treatment um, in the back of the classroom or with potentially an aide that spends half of their time in the classroom and half of their, or one day a week helping those mm-hmm. kids with you. Well, now yep. that aid is seeing what you're doing and getting that, all that is going right back into the classroom. That's exactly right. And we see that at brick and mortar schools That's as great. well. We see that same thing going on. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, this is the opposite side of that question. What mm-hmm. I'm sure there has been a time where you kind of felt that maybe you can't help this kid potentially, or if there's just another challenge, but what has been one instance when you had a big challenge with a case? Sure. Um, you know, there haven't been a whole lot of times where I've recommended in-person services, but there, there have been a few. Um, and I'm happy to recommend in-person services if needed, because I, you know, ultimately I want, I, I don't want telehealth to succeed. I do, but only because I want the child to succeed. Can I stop so, you real quick? What do you mean when you recommend, you just said, I will recommend, or I will do in-person therapy. No, I will recommend a transfer from telehealth to in-person okay. if needed. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm happy to do that if that if that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hasn't hasn't happened a whole lot where I felt like, you know, they really, you know, the child I'm working with doesn't really needs an in-person therapist as opposed to telehealth. Mm-hmm. But it has happened a few times. And, you know, I, I want the child to succeed. And there was one there was one case in particular um, where the boy um, had had more profound autism and he honestly didn't even know I was there. Um, he was constantly being prompted to, to look at the screen, to look at me, but he just really didn't have that awareness. And we tried everything. I mean, I went all the way down to, I had the aide make boxes, you know, Yeah. and we're just going through box number one. The, there's the activity box number two, uh-huh. box number three, but it's still, it was just such a challenge um, because he just had no awareness that there was a therapist even in the space. And yeah. so um, that was just a huge challenge for me. And we made it work for a while, but ultimately, um, ultimately we found him, we found a therapist to, to come in and, and see him. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we, we had to turn it off because if, if you, you have to be able to connect with the yeah, person absolutely. You know, at, on some level. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't make that connection, um, without being in physically his in space, the world. Yeah. Physically. Okay. Yep. I lied. I have one more question only because what you said kind of makes me wonder. Um, some of those more, like you said, mod severe type of kids, maybe, or even the kids who have low, um, maybe an intellectual disability, and maybe they're mm-hmm. in high school and they're functioning at that really much lower mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, does that get a little difficult with over over the web? It can, but ultimately, if if you can make a connection with them, um, if you can connect, you know, your person with that person, mm-hmm. then you can probably do therapy. Okay, I see that as a bigger challenge. Um, but there are definitely there are definitely challenges with that. Like some of the life skills um, um, are hard. Uh, not not life skills, but like. Um, like ADL type yeah. of things, you know, if they're in a life skills program or something, it's yeah. hard to work on, on, you know, bathroom stuff or something like that or, or kitchen stuff. But, um, we, we sometimes do what we need to do. We create simulations, um, as best we can, um, yeah. especially if it's a case of them not getting services. Definitely. You know, 
And I, it's hard, I think, for any occupational therapist sometimes to be in those life skills classes. Yeah. I'm in a high school life skills class, and it takes a lot of energy. It takes a ton of collaboration, um, communication, yeah. all that good stuff. Um, I do. Well, then love you're it. already well suited for telehealth. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> you're one collaborating. Day. We'll you're see. communicating. <laughs> but but here's one thing that I do with them, and maybe I mean I could. Again, being, um, as you said, in order to be a telehealth, you have to be a problem solver. One yeah. of the things I love doing with that classroom is every now and then I attend the community outing. Mm -hmm. But again, now I can see it already, you know, kind of working through it. Those teachers have iPhones. Those teachers have stuff that they take with them. And mm -hmm. I, uh, heck, most of the kids have iPhones or tablets or whatever, you know, and it yep. could happen with the right collaboration. Potentially. So, yes, it could. So, yeah, that's super yes, cool. Yes, it could. All righty. Yep. Well, that was like the quickest hour I've ever had in my life. Um, thank you so much <laughs> for all that information. I love it. Um, oh, good. Is there anything you felt like we forgot to say? Um, I don't think so. I think we covered, I think we covered pretty much everything that I wanted to make sure that we covered. So, well done. <laughs> awesome. Well done, us. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. It's awesome sure. that we're able to do this on the podcast. Yeah. Where can people reach out to you if they have questions or is that okay? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I can be reached at, and you might want to, you might want to, you know, put this in print too, but I can definitely be um, reached at T as in Tracy Davis, T Davis at talkpathlive.com. Awesome. And yes, that will be on the episode show notes, which will probably, I might have to edit this, but otschoolhouse.com forward slash episode 22. Um, and so that will be the show notes where you will be able to not only listen to this episode, well, you've already got that far. Um, <laughs> you're already listening right now, so you've already got that part. But um, sure. also any of the resources that Tracy has sent me that we can put up onto that site so that maybe some links to um, like the AOTA document she was referencing earlier, we'll have a link to that on there as well as a link. And also the international, I'm sorry, I don't know. You're fine. You. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Go ahead. But, but I was just going to say that the, the um, international journal of telerehabilitation is actually a free publication. Oh, perfect. So, um, so that's a really great resource. It has a lot of um, research in it. So great. Um, well, yes. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate you so much for coming on here. All your information was fantastic. And you made me like, I know you can't see me, all you've out there, but like I'm putting my fingers together. Like you made me that much closer to doing telehealth in the near future. So, um, yay, <laughs> winning you over. Right. So, <laughs> anyone out there, okay. if you have any questions about telehealth, be sure to reach out to Tracy. Um, she's also active in, like she said, some of those Facebook groups. So, there is telehealth Facebook groups out there. Um, be sure to join those. And if you have any other questions and you're not sure, feel free to reach out to me or her and we will point you in the right direction. So um, thank you Absolutely. so much for listening. Thank you, Tracy. And we'll see you all next time. All right. Well, that wraps up today's episode number 22, all about telehealth. Be sure to head over to otschoolhouse.com forward slash episode 22 for all the different links that we talked about in the show. On our website, you'll also have the opportunity to earn professional development for listening to this podcast. All you have to do is purchase episode 22, Professional Development Opportunity, and you'll take a short quiz. And once you pass that quiz, we will send you a certificate of completion that you can use for NBCOT and some state professional development requirements. And with that, I just want to say thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the OT Schoolhouse podcast. Take care. Thank you for listening to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. For more ways to help you and your students succeed right now, head on over to OTSchoolhouse.com. Until next time, class is dismissed.